I'll be honest with you. It is uncomfortably warm in the skybox at the corner of the level this evening. I'm Rez Mason. I am recovering from a cold. I am slightly more experienced in making grilled cheese. And I am overheated because it was in the 90s outside today. Uh, there's a bit of catch-up that I owe folks from the previous episode. Um, quick reminder, in the previous episode, this application, which has different um, versions, different engines, uh, like um, Naive, uh, the core code that makes this application work belongs in something called an engine, and we now have different versions of the engine, which are color-coded. And we did that... Uh, sorry, they're not just color-coded, they also correspond with different... Um, different... Where are they? Here we go. Uh, different points, different milestones of the, um, of the project. And those milestones more or less correspond with an, an improvement in performance, which is represented by this number, oh, by this number in the bottom right. So for example, this Alive engine runs at 345 generations per second which is pretty good, but we would like to be able to compare that maybe with the default engine. Which as we can see is much faster. By the way, we might not hit the expected performance levels during this episode because not only did I neglect to upload the previous um, the previous episode to YouTube, um, I neglected to charge the laptop that I stream from. So, um, it is charging. I am not expecting the machine to perform as well as it normally would. Anyway, um, still impressive. Uh, 4,000 generations per second in flat. Um, the thing is, the names of these engines is not documented, right? There's no place in this project, like I could do it in GitHub, Res Mason, Wireworld Player. I could list them here, which I think I did with... I think I did that in the Wireworld... Nope, I didn't. So there really isn't any documentation of the... Um, of the different names that we chose for these different versions of the engine. So, um, it made sense to not just do this trick where you can name the engine you're interested in in the URL, but to also add a dropdown, which looks a little fancier than it used to. The dropdown used to be up here at the end of the last episode, it was up here and now it's down here next to the speedometer. Um, mainly because while it does involve speed, it really, it's more about its performance and comparing the performance of these different implementations. They're in order from oldest to newest. Um, and what I was struggling with at the end of the last episode of the last stream was being able to simulate the um, this pattern um, in one engine and then uh, s just hot swap to another engine. So you'll notice the generation is still in the hundreds of thousands. It's like 100,000 at, at least. Uh, the digit on this handy display inside this uh, virtual computer is at five, whereas it usually starts at zero, right? So we know just now that we successfully swapped between 
the flat engine and the neighbor's engine. And we can hot swap, boom, to the linked engine. We can s swap all the way down to the naive engine, the alive engine. These are not the final colors of the different engines. Um, I'm happy with some of these, but uh, I don't know. I'll, um, I'll fiddle with those color themes uh, at some later date. But yeah, uh, I ended the last stream way late after the normal sign-off time because I was struggling to get this data in a format that all the different engines could agree on. Um, and that format, you know, you, you could say, oh, that format should just be, uh, you know, the, um, the format that comes out of the parser because we have a parse.js which takes things like um, like this text version of sorry one second here we go um, huh sorry one second for some reason my mouse isn't properly scrolling I'll have to look into it later. Here, word wrap off. That's why, it wasn't the mouse, it was the editor. Okay, so we can see in this text file, Owen Moore Horizontal, that some of the structures that are in this pattern on screen um, are represented in a kind of ASCII format um, in this file. And the parser's job is to take this format um, and another format called MCL, which just happens to be a format that is used for a lot of the other um, the other example files that we have, but is a little harder to make sense of, right? Like, what is this? It's hard to say. Um, but it's more compressed. Regardless, the parser takes these two formats and it turns them into a an array of arrays of cell states. So remember, cell states allow us to say, you know, every cell, every pixel really, is one of four colors. There's the dead color, there's the wire color, there is the head color, and the tail color. And it maps these, these characters in this text file to cell states and just like this text file is a grid, right? It's like a grid of characters. The parser turns that grid of characters into a grid of cell states. And then... Here we are. The result is passed by the main Wireworld module into the engine and the engine dot uh, engine common uh, initialize here we are uh, gets that data and um, you know passes it into each engine's initialize function which then you know if I look at naive initialize grabs the width, it grabs the height, um, and it looks in that grid of cell states and turns it into whatever representation of data is internal to the engine. And remember, these engines are actually, sorry, there we go. These engines are actually very different from each other on the inside. Um, on the inside, this stores all, you know, the, the naive implementation, uh, which we started with, stores all of these pixels in a 2D grid um, and computes the next generation by looking in that grid and doing a whole bunch of stuff that we now know is suboptimal. Um, whereas in the neighbor's engine, uh, there's still a 2D grid, but, or sorry, in the neighbor's engine, 
there's no longer a 2D grid. There's just a list of cells, and they have a list. Each cell has a list of its neighbors. So this cell that has an electron tail right now, right, tail? Yeah. This cell that has an electron tail um, has a neighbor here and a neighbor here. So its list contains references to these two cells and has a length of just two. But um, this cell, this cell has a list of neighbors of length zero because it has no neighbors, right? And this cell has a neighbor list of length three and it contains these three. Sorry, four of length four because of that, that fourth one. Yeah. Anyway, um, and so the representation of the simulation in the memory of this engine, Neighbors, is entirely different from Naive, which is entirely different from Linked and Flat. And remember, Linked and Flat are kind of comparable. Uh, their difference is uh, Flat gets rid of some of the weird stuff that we were relying on JavaScript to do, like modeling cells as objects and containing properties um, but otherwise these two are the same they um my point is these engines are very different on the inside but in order for us to support them in the first place like this we did have to change um like as we were writing them out uh last week in the last episode um what we ended up doing was making them all speak the same language that the renderer speaks. So the reason that we can see any of them on screen right now is because they all do two things the exact same way. They all send the renderer a list of every non-dead cell, and that list is in order. So the index into that list is a unique number for every cell. And so that tells the renderer what cells should be drawn as wire and what cells should be drawn as dead. But it also gives the renderer a lookup table of every cell to draw as a head or a tail when we tell it to. And that's the other thing that all the engines now do. They send in the render function, they send the renderer a list of heads and a list of tails. Specifically, the indices of those heads and tails in the list of all non-dead cells that the renderer is initialized with. In other words, all the data needed to construct this image is formatted the same way across all these different engines. And to be honest, that is a much cleaner means of transferring the state from one of these engines to the other when, you know, like in the middle of running, uh, we do a hot swap. Boom. Right? What happens there is in the Wireworld module, in the swap engines function, Wireworld sends post message save to the engine. It tells the engine save data. And the engine comes back with save data. And as soon as it does that, we stop listening to that engine and we use we repurpose our rebuild engine function to terminate that engine, stop listening to it for anything, and create a new one in its place and start listening to that. Only now, um, rebuild engine uses engine name to look up the web worker that corresponds with the dropdown in the UI or with the URL. So, um, we rebuild the engine, and, you know, if we just let it, if we just, um, left it at that, 
then it would reset the um, the state of our simulation when we initialize. But instead of passing in the data we get from the parser, this time around we pass in the data that we get from the previous engine. Which does contain, if we look in the engine common save function, here we are, the save data is a, an extension, is a copy of the original data that we parsed out. Mainly because that's the least error-prone solution, right? It's good to just have this data around. But we attach to it a save data object that contains the current generation, the current head IDs, and the current tail IDs. Except it's not the current head and tail IDs. It's the grid indices. It is the the X and Y basically. It's like the it's the unique ID of the pixel that the head or tail occupies. Because again, that grid index is like the shared language between all these engines. It is the thing that we tell the renderer that you know light this pixel up, light that pixel up, and then. When we initialize, if there is a save data object, then we copy it and we reproduce the head ID and tail ID lists that map those grid indices back into the IDs. And we just pass that into reset. And then reset recovers the generation from that, because that's pretty straightforward, and then passes it into the hard-coded reset, which, for a naive, for instance, um, save data. If save, so, you know, each engine uses that save data differently in the reset function. In naive, it basically says, oh, there's save data, then create a set of all the head IDs and all the tail IDs, um, find every non-dead cell, get its grid index, and then um, by default it's wire, and it's a head if that grid index is in the saved head IDs, and it's a tail if that's in the cell IDs by grid index. This is the wrong name. Cell ID. Alive. Cell grid index. This should be cell ID. Uh, and in neighbors. Uh, reset. Um, has ID. Okay, good. Cool. Okay. I named some variables wrong in naive and alive. Okay. Let me try that again. So we make sets that we can easily look up head IDs and tail, you know, the cell IDs in these to check for membership. We iterate in the, in, uh, the naive, you know, uh, reset function over every single pixel that isn't dead. And then we get its cell ID and we look it up in the saved heads or the saved tails. And for the other engines, the, you know, the result is basically the same. Let me just check that this works. Flat. Boom. And we are at two. And then naive. Two. Good. And flat. And alive. Two. Good. Okay. Everything is working as it should. Okay. Isn't this cool? What other website lets you do this? Like, there are, I mean, I realize there is no indication right now to a user what is going on, right? It's not obvious what this app does. Um, you can kind of suss it out. So yes, there, there will be a little better UX and conveyance when I get around to it. Um, but as an educational tool, Somebody interested in how you make a simulation like this 
can now try these different engines. And we can talk about those engines uh, in the uh, help text or something and link to their implementations, right? But they can compare them and be like, oh, wow, okay. So a JavaScript uh, algorithm to simulate this computer um, that, you know, iterates over every cell, but it ignores the dead cells. Um, performs at roughly like 275 generations per second. Whereas if you represent the neighbors of every cell, so same simulation, but instead of iterating over your nine neighbors, um, you just have a list of those neighbors. If you click that, boom, and now we're at 330 generations per second. So that's the sort of speed up that we can expect if we perform that optimization. If we replace the um, if we replace the grid of cells with uh, linked lists of cells where all the heads from the previous generation are linked together, all the tails are linked together, and you generate the new heads from the list of heads on update, We went from 330 to 1,000 and let's say 1,150, 1,160, right? And then when we flatten it and we see that we get that advancement just from walking away from the JavaScript uh, objects, right? And going straight to um, a, uh, an array buffer, which granted, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but uh, flat. So, you know, the code in flat, actually, the code in flat is pretty small. What's nice about this engine stuff, by the way, is engine common stores a lot of things in just 200 lines of code um, that are uh, shared between all of these engines. And that allows each engine to be a much smaller. Um, easier to comprehend chunk of code, right? By the way, another thing that I did after the stream last uh, last episode was I replaced the um, ECMAScript class syntax, because I was using classes to do this, um, which is weird, right? Because we aren't actually using classes, it was just an opportunity to do inheritance, but now I've got it based on composition instead, the engine common file um, creates an engine, basically. It initializes a system inside an object. Not even in an object, it's just in a closure. So build engine is a closure, and you pass in the theme that you want things to look like, right? Like yellow and orange is this theme, uh, blueprint colors is this theme. Um, you pass in an initialize function, a reset function, an update function, and a render function. And all of the stuff that has to be done no matter what occurs outside of those functions and just calls those functions inside, right? There's reset. Calls the internal reset. Update calls the internal update. Um, Although, hang on, where am I calling update? Not in a lot of places. <laughs> Let me just try something, one second. Update, replace with generation plus plus update. And these, um, oopsie. Replace with that, and generation plus equals six, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's just try that. <laughs> I'm just curious, like, why not? Yeah, still works properly, right? I think.
whatever. I'm happy with just doing this little update function. Not a problem. I mean, it does add a little bit of overhead, but I mean, the, the, the goals that we have for this project moving forward are going to make an optimization like getting rid of this no big deal. I hope. Because after I walk, uh, walk us through these changes from after the last stream, um, we are going to do some research. Uh, we are going to explore the unknown. Okay, so... Renamed... Impro uh, some variables in the naive live reset implementation. Yeah, reset implementation um, were improperly named. Is that the only change I made? It is. Let's run the prettier. No change. Push. Okay. How's my battery? Almost 70%. Okay. Let's stop with that nonsense. So, um, again, this is a JavaScript project so that people can just browse to it, right? Boom. Um, eventually it will live at resmason.net slash wireworld, which at the moment <laughs> displays the 10 year old flash version to nobody because the flash player, the flash plugin no longer runs. Um, and right, we're trying to make it run as fast as possible. Um, as an exploration of the performance constraints of JavaScript and web tech in general. Um, it is impressive what we're able to accomplish uh, with, with um, just plain old JavaScript. We have not attempted any uh, graphics accelerator you know, strategy, um, which will come later. That's more of a... That's more of a kind of flight of fancy. We've just, you know, we haven't used um, WebAssembly either. WebAssembly being a powerful... Here we go. A very powerful API for... Whatever. A powerful API for computing things um, across the web uh, at a low level without JavaScript. Um, so that we could take things like C or Python or, you know, some other language that's not native to the web and compile it into a, an assembly, just like a, kind of like a binary executable, um, but that every browser can read, right? And, um, and that, um, And that doesn't have the limitations of JavaScript, right? When we went from links to flat, we shed a lot of the um, slower things in JavaScript. Um, we will, at some point, try to do some WebAssembly stuff, but not tonight. Tonight is an opportunity for me to learn absolutely new things, and if you are interested, you can watch me learn them. The thing that I'm learning, whoopsie, is Gosper's hash life. So this application Golly that I've shown a few times, um, patterns, wire world. You know what? Actually, I will show. Is this ex is this interesting? No. What's a good? Sorry, one moment. You know what? Might as well do hash life. Um, I 
I don't know what this is. Unlimited novelty. Whoops. Let's reset that, because I have no idea where we are. Okay. Ah, I bet unlimited novelty creates a region in space that is difficult for hash life to compute. But regardless, um, you know, I haven't run this for very long, right? But we are already at generation 681,000, and I am way zoomed out. If I zoom in, you can see, okay, here are the cells, right? Um, zoomed back out, it's kind of hard to fathom just how much computation is happening right now. These pixels that we're seeing here are gliders. Are they just gliders? Pairs of gliders that are going off in this direction, right? It's actually interesting that they are going in that line. And there's other gliders that are going in this line. And there's all kinds of construction going on here. Yeah. So we are at population 2 million. Um, this, this might not have seemed impressive, but this, for, for this pattern to even be computable in that period of time is incredibly impressive. This is actually a stress test for hash life. Um, let's try a different one, like uh, Metapixel. What is this? There we go. Look at that. <laughs> so what we're looking at right now is Conway's Game of Life being accelerated through hash life to simulate Conway's game of life. Now the reason the reason there's these empty gaps and then there's these weird bits is because um, whoever created this decided that these pixels should not be made any place where they will never be filled as an optimization. Um, and so we are seeing a Conway's Game of Life sim running. Look at this. Sorry, this whole time I was looking at population and thinking that was the generation. It's not. This is the generation. 1.545 times 10 to the 14. 1.545 times 10 to... This is leaving the existing Wireworld player in the dust, right? Here, Metapixel. Off you go. So now we are running Gosper's life in life. And it is stepping. By the way, this step is exponential. Basically, the time scale that the simulation can advance at in hash life has to be, well, it has to be a power of some base. And the idea is, it's hard to describe. My, my understanding of hash life is basically, um, Trans, you, you model the you model the world in a quad tree, and a quad tree is one of these gizmos. So this is all of space, right? This box encompasses all of these points as data. The points are stored in the boxes that enclose them. But it's weird, right? Because some of the boxes are small and some of the boxes are large. Well, 
these four boxes actually occupy this box and this box and this box and this box and this box actually occupy this box and this quadrant and this quadrant and this quadrant and this quadrant occupy this box so there is a there is a there's a fractal it is fractal but that's beside the point there is a hierarchy there's a hierarchy actually this is a better image to demonstrate there's a hierarchy of nodes right it's a tree of nodes where each layer represents a smaller area and one of the reasons to do this is to simplify um, collision detection in a game for example right um, if uh, if this circle if you're interested in whether this circle and this circle collide you can be like well are they in um, the same bounding box or you know if you if you measure um, this radius and this radius and you add them up you can be like are there any bounding boxes around this guy's bounding box that are close enough that they could collide point is that that wasn't a good description but basically you can reduce the complexity of your model to just represent things that are proximal to each other that are close together right so you don't have to have this resolution to your model in a completely empty space so so golly's using gosper's hash life algorithm and it does this. It takes not all these cells, but all of these cells, and it puts them in quad trees. Sorry, it puts them in a quad tree, but it's not just any quad tree. Um, the nodes are cached. In other words, um, if, for example, It's a poor example, but if this, if these four cells were in a node of the quad tree, and these four cells were in the node of a quad tree, then they would be represented by the same node. The, the parent of this node over here, and the parent of this node over here, would reference the same node. In other words, for Conway's Game of Life, there are only two level one nodes. X and O, right? Alive and dead. And let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and eight level two nodes, which is like this. X zero, zero, zero. Okay, let me do this again. X, 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 X. X, 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 X. Yep, and then X, um, X, X. Then X O X O X O X O. I think that's all of them. Are any of these the same? No, they're not. But you see what I'm getting at. Um, and if you look at this, every X in here is just a reference to this guy, and every O in here is a reference to this guy. Now, how many level fours are there? Well, well, I don't know. It's some number of level three, not level four, level three nodes, such as XX. Um, I should use a classic one. Hang on.
Um, there's one from the Dr. Dobbs. Just gonna transcribe it because I wanna I wanna at least understand how my knowledge of this expands over time. There we go. Okay, so x x x x x x x is it just that? Yes. Okay. So if we look at this, this guy, O X X O, is is not up here. Hang on. <laughs> X, 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 O, 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 O. X, X, O, O, X, X, O, O. X, 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 X. Okay, that's the one that I got wrong. Okay. One second. You know, I'm going to do these all over again. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. Thanks for your patience. Okay, the first one, I'm going to have half of it be X, the first half be X, and the second half be O. The second one is going to be the first half of that is X, and then the second half is O, and the first half of this is X, and the second half is O. Okay, now this one is going to be X, O, Let's see. X, X, O, O. X, X, O, O. There's 16, aren't there? <sighs> Obliterate this again. X O O O O O O it's magic and that's all I can probably sing I'm making this hard for myself <laughs> let's do this um, X O X O Um, X, O, and then lastly, everything to the left of this gets an X up top. Okay, so now I should have all of them. <sighs> and that makes sense. This number, 16, should be 2 to the 4, right? On off times on off times on off times on off. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 equals 16. Anyway, the point I was trying to make down here is here's like an arbitrary pattern, right? And it's got as this Dr. Dobbs article from 2006 uh, illustrates, the quad tree has a northwest, a northeast, a southwest, and a southeast uh, node. That is half the size. And these correspond with some of these, right? OXXO, OXXO, there we go. And then OOXO, OOXO. Down here, XOOX, XOOX. And then a, another OXXO. And so this node and this node are actually the same. And they literally are the same. This illustration makes it look like it branches, but actually, you just wind up, here we go, you just wind up mapping. Um, all of the shared nodes together like this. So the quad tree is hierarchical, but the actual nodes that you're using don't have to be. Right? 
Um, so, we're actually going to call this uh, 1, 0, x, o, and then this is going to be called a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, i, j, k, l, m, n, o, p. And this guy is actually... Ugh. Can't select out here. One second. 2D typing is a little awkward sometimes. Okay. So this guy, OXXO, OXXO is J. Same down here, J. Right? We don't even need to contain these, right? And then OOXO, OOXO, that is. N, and then XOOX was over here, and that's G. Right? In other words, the quad tree to the left has the nodes to the right that are in this list, just as these nodes have these nodes in this list. Ugh. So what good is this? What's cool about this is because the neighborhood in Conway's excuse me. I'm I'm sorry. <clears throat> because the neighborhood in Conway's game of life is a 3x3 three three grid. Every 2 to the Well, every 4x4 four four grid can store the 2x2 two two future of its center. In other words, um, If we do this, sorry, these actually should be um, zero, and these should be one. There we go. Yeah. You get the idea. <laughs> so, um, this raw value. Um, let me make it a glider, actually. So, one, 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 whoops, one, 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 like that. So this is a Conway glider. Um, so first of all, zero, one, zero, one, which is OXOX, is K. O, 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 one, is O. And then down here, a one o o. A one o o is L. And then down here, one o o o. One o o is H. There we go. So this is a representation of the quad trees, uh, the the nodes of level two that comprise this. Um, but we also have a future that we can represent, which is this, the center of this. So let's compute it real quick. 
Um, what happens in the future for all these guys? So I'm just going to... Okay. Um, well, we, we don't know about the border, right? Because their neighbors are outside of this 4x4. But we can answer this question for the central two cells. So this cell um, has... What's Conway's... Conway's life? The rules. I just need to quickly brush up on the rules. Sorry. Oh boy. This is embarrassing. Conway's life rules. <laughs> <sighs> That's a video or something. Thank you, Wikipedia. Rules. Okay. Any live cell with fewer than... Okay, any live cell with two or three live neighbors, li neighbors lives on to the next generation. So this one is a live cell up here with three live neighbors. So it lives on. Let's... Let's find out for this one. So it's dead, but it has one, two, three, four, five live neighbors. So a dead cell with exactly three becomes a live cell. Oh, these are easier. Any dead cell with three ones. Okay. So this one stays dead because it doesn't have exactly three neighbors. This one down here, it's alive and it has two, so it stays alive. And this one is alive and it has two, so it stays alive. So these are the future states of these cells. It happens to be no different from before. But because it's in the center, um, or rather because it stays the same like this, um, so we would what we would do... One zero one one. So we're done simulating. So the future of this XOXX, XOXX is E. So in other words, that was a lot of manual work, but basically, in other words, the Level 3 node XOLH has a central future of E. So that's pretty neat, but sadly, the work of finding out. Oh, sorry. So Right, every 4x4 four four grid, every 4x4 four four grid, every level 3 node can store the level 2 future of its center. There we go. But higher level nodes can store... Sorry. This can be generalized to any node. And n by a a level n node can store the level n minus one future of its center. However, nodes of a level greater than three have to stitch together the futures of their child nodes. In other words, um, ugh. well, I'm going to just point at some of these images. Um, here we go. So this is a level 4 node, right? And its children are level 3. And they have level two futures in their centers, right? To get the central, f 
future of the level 4, which is a level 3 node, we can borrow <laughs> these parts of the level 3, which look meager, I admit. However, um, it's one quarter of the work, right? So sometimes that's quite useful. What the hash life algorithm does is it actually reconstructs, excuse me, it actually reconstructs the rest of that center so that you can compute it. It, it fills in this central, right, so I should say that. Um, I do do that, I do say that. So stitching together is a central part of this. Um, but once you can stitch these things together, the caching you do is, what would you call it? Is multi-level, right? Like this, according to one of Gosper's biggest fans who um, presented Hash Life in a six minute talk uh, that does not cover the details, understandably, um, the, the speed up that we would get from this is considerable. But, but the special sauce The magic of Hash Life is the super speed, which is basically this. And this is this is wild. I'm not going to try to illustrate it in text, but basically, the future stored in the center of this four x four doesn't have to be the immediate future, one time step in the future. It can be two to the n steps in the future, where n is the level of the node. So a level four node, I think, can store two steps in the future rather than one, and a level eight node can store four steps in the future, and a level Sorry, a level 4 node can store 8 in the future, and a level 5 can store 16 in the future. Something like that. Um, the level uh, with a clever twist to the algorithm the a level n node can store its central future at 2 to the n minus m steps. I forget what m is, but it's constant. I should make it a constant, n minus c. I forget what c is. You get what I'm saying? So the reason, whoa, <laughs> the reason Golly can simulate so fast, right? So it's that generation, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, a million, two million, four million, eight million. The reason this is possible is because the steps are accelerating. You see, it went from 8 to the 6th to 8 to the 7th. And then it'll do 8 to the 8th. Now this is cool and all, but just to be clear, this is still a stress test of hash life. The Golly, uh, the Golly program supports something like hash life, like super speed, right? For Wireworld as well. And remember, Wireworld behaves quite nicely, I think, because basically it never escapes its boundary. The size of the simulation, in, like the spatial size, never changes. Um, the configuration changes. 
changes all the time. But every configuration changes. The future is always different from the past, right? Unless you have like a... Um, uh, what are they called? A cycle. A clock. Or whatever they're called. A looping pattern. Um, so when we run a Wireworld simulation in Gali, we're at 8 to the 4, 8 to the 5, 8 to the 6th, staying at 8 to the 6th, 8 to the 7th, but look at this. <laughs> 83, 89, 97, 101, 103. It's entirely possible that the program to find prime numbers represented in this uh, simulated Wireworld computer is entirely possible that based on the speed of the hash life algorithm, uh, it will skip some results, right? Because the cached future of this simulation might not need to represent, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's pretty impressive. 211, 223, 229. I'm gonna stop it there, because it's at 220 million generations right now, which you may notice this is running slower than the hash life that was doing Conway's Game of Life. And one of the reasons for that is because Conway's Game of Life, however, Conway's Game of Life has uh, fewer states, has two states, and simpler rules than Wireworld. So there are clever programming tricks it can leverage that perhaps we cannot right because these states these two states correspond with zeros and ones so that a single bit in a number could represent a single cell right this is my current understanding of hash life. Now, Gali's source code is open source, but I'm not 100% sure whether hash life is actually written to support Wireworld. Um, it's also written in a different language than, you know, the one that we're using. Um, but there is a hash life implementation that someone named Copy produced. Uh, it is licensed under BSD. Let's see. Redistribution of source code must retain the above. Right, right, right. Redistributions in binary form must produce. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do clean room, right? But I'm not going to copy this stuff either. During the stream, I'm going to read this JavaScript and take notes. But before I do that, I'm going to read a few other explanations including this original one, right? This is one that I read years ago to get this far. I'm going to reread it to better understand. Oh, but it's seven pages. Is it? Maybe not. One moment. Uh, if I do print, what happens? I see. That is the entire article. Although, I will I will keep it in this format, just because this is simpler. <laughs> and in black and white. Thanks, Dr. Dobbs, whoever that is. Hope you haven't been problematic since 2006. Um, now, there's someone named, well, Jenny Owens, who, um, Owen. Sorry, hang on. Because... The Wireworld computer is made by by a
sorry, one second. Right, Mark Owen is one of the collaborators of the Wireworld computer. I wonder if Jenny Owen is at all related to Mark Owen. That is, you know what? That is a question I will answer off stream because it's none of your business and it's none of my business, but I can still find out and I think it would be interesting to know. Um, but, you know, I'm not gonna venture into that uncomfortable territory uh, on stream. Anyway, just gonna read this real quick. It would be cool to read Jenny Owen's master's dissertation. Oh, wait. So that's the original paper, and then this one. You know what? I'll look this up in my free time as well. But I will read Jenny Owen's website. Gosper's algorithm. Okay. Hashing 2D cellular automata, like ours. If, if she can be contacted, I will also thank her after the stream. Um... That's good positive feedback. I see. This is, okay, so this is the section of her dissertation that's online. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> unfortunate students. I guess, I guess I have made myself an unfortunate student. And don't want to spend the best part of a week stumbling through the original paper. You can stumble through this as well. Thank you. Um, is highly efficient when compared with other simulators because it uses hashing and a mechanism Gosper named macro cells. That's what this is. The special sauce. Uh, no, these stitching things together different nodes. <coughs> hashing. Actually, I'll be right back. I'm gonna quit Gosper. Almost full charge on the battery. I'll be right back. I'm just going to um, hydrate because I'm caffeinating, but caffeinated soda does not exactly hydrate as well as water.
Well, thanks for waiting. I left to get some water, and I did get water. What else did I get? Half a bacon grilled cheese. Life is good. It's stressful. It's complicated sometimes, but it's good. Sorry, one moment. I need to blow my nose. Right. Where were we? Hash table. JavaScript hash tables are built in, but we might implement our own. Ah, she's making a big deal of the key in the hash table being generated from um, other data, which for a lower level implementation makes perfect sense. I wonder how that will transfer over to a JavaScript implementation. I should write that down. Um, notes from Jenny has a hat research. Okay, right, so um, the method of hashing is significant. How will we look up what will we use as key values, uh, as keys in our hash table? cells not directly reference their futures? Are the futures just stored in the hash table, keyed by their pasts? Macro cell is a okay. Enough speculation. A macro cell is a square of cellular right. So terminology, macro cell. We are going to adopt that terminology. does point to five. Okay, so that's not true. This might be true. Okay, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast, and central future. That's the five smaller two and I think four of these are the four quarters of the right. One, two, three, four. The other cells what Gosper refers to as the result. Okay. Result, aka central future. Okay. It contains the state of 
the macrocell after two to the n minus two steps. Okay, so up here, we can change that C in here. C equals two. Here, you know what? I'll just put it in, n minus two. Okay. Two to the <clears throat> carrot and minus two future. Um, central future. And it is e entirely determined by the state of the macro cell. That is an important insight. You can always, always, always compute this from what's out here. In a worst case scenario, you write all of these cells out, simulate it, and store it. The reason the result is that size is that it will take that number of time steps for information outside the macro cell to penetrate the result cell's border. Yep, all of these neighbor relationships have a kind of Einstein relativistic light cone where this future is impacted by this past for any scale. And because we're talking about larger scales of space, we're talking about deeper scales of time. The result square is the only information that can be accurately predicted. Yes. So true, so true. So it's an important thing to note is that they are recursive, yes. Not gonna shy away from recursion. Right, which of course, so these are the X's and O's we were fully around with. Each macro cell can also be reused. If a macro cell is a repeat of a previously discovered one, then it will behave in exactly the same way. That's, that's what they're for. The hash table contains all macro cells. When That's what it is. So anytime you have to stitch together the future, you can then convert that data into a key into the hash table in case that state's future is already represented. Got it. I wonder if the hash table stores all macro cells regardless of level, or if there's a different hash table for each level. That might be implementation specific. in size, it is easy to calculate the result using brute force. Okay. At some level, the result is trivial to brute force. The cell only needs to advance one time step. That makes sense. However, problems arise when n is greater than 2. Yep. If we take the... Right. We see the results from the quadrants do not fill the area required. Furthermore, these results are from 2 to the n minus 3 time steps into the future and not 2 to the n minus 2, because the existing results are from the quadrant cells 
of size to the n minus one. And so the result is at time two to the n minus two minus one or two to the n minus three, right? So actually, these four corners aren't 1 16th of the result. They are, let's see, they are 1 36th of the past of the result. The solution Gosper pr proposed is scalable for all values of n. We will explain it here using an example n equals 3. For some reason, this is easier to focus on than the Dobbs article, though I haven't tried reading this in a long time. The first step... Okay. Gosper's... algorithm in English in simple terms right compute the Compute the future at the time step of the children's computed futures. So that gives you the corners, and then you have to do these ones. So this is the stitching. I'm going to call it Gosperize. Gosperify? Gosperize. Just for now. Right, so this future, this future, this future, this future. Great. Oh, and we can, right, we can use more of them. So actually, it's not as bad as I thought. These four futures we can immediately apply, and that gives us one, two, three, four, four out of nine. Not four out of nine. What am I saying? Oh, no, yeah, four out of nine because it's divisible by three. Okay. I gotta, I gotta focus. Okay. The remaining area is calculated by making five temporary... Okay. The corners are already solved. The five unsolved missing bits... are made by temporarily constructing five macro cells. The remaining area is calculated by making five temporary macro cells. But how do you make a macro cell? Ah, we've got their present. Oh, it's a four by four, not small macro. Um, yeah, small macro cells. You know, whoops. 
you know they're present, Gosperize their future. And that lets you stitch those. And then we need to reduce the 6x6 six six into a 4x4. Four four. By creating four more temporaries. Temporary. Right. Then make four uns um, the result is a middle ground future. Make four more unsolved missing macro, uh, make four more temporary macro cells from the middle ground and solve them and gospelize them. Anytime you gospelize though, look up or gospelize. You start by looking up if the result is already known, I guess? I suppose? And that gives you the result. That gives you a properly sized, properly timed result. Do the temporary macro cells get thrown away? What scheme is used to prune the cache? The hash table? Okay. The overall result... Right, 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 sorry. With larger... Okay. The overall result of the algorithm is to consume much less memory than a naive alternative, absolutely, through recycling of macrocells. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is nice. The macrocells are also able to predict their state 2 to the n minus 2 steps into the future, and if n is large, this also results in a significant loss of overhead. Hash life performs best for repetitive or periodic patterns, like wire world. I mean, it's not 100% repetitive, but no pattern is 100 I mean, you never feed hash life a 100% repetitive pattern. You're interested in the ones that are not fully aperiodic. patterns, the algorithm is less efficient as macro cells are less likely to be repeated. Right. Sorry, one second.
sorry for the wait. <sighs> Life does not sit still for a live stream, does it? But it's all good. Right, so, this is... Jenny has a hat, I don't have a hat, but if I had a hat, it hats off to Jenny who has a hat, because this really boosts my confidence in my ability to implement this. It doesn't seem so difficult because of this explanation, really. I'm sure I'm sure we're going to encounter some real serious bugs, but um, I'm more amped than ever to try this. Okay. Also, it really helps that the explanation that Jenny Owen provides doesn't go through the incremental uh, steps that the YouTube video I had previously watched recommends, where um, you put everything in macro cells and um, only model the immediate future uh, in every macro cell rather than the full time step. It is interesting that at some point the time step will have to be adjustable. So to adjust the time step, do you create a higher versus lower level quad tree? In other words, technically, Wireworld right now has macro cells of size 1. They're not very good, right? But if they were good, and I made the step size 2 to the 1, then it would run the exact same way as it currently does. But if I made it 2 to the 2 or 2 to the 3, little quad trees adjacent to each other would occupy the entire simulation. And each of them would share the cache and would simulate at that level. And then as I increase the time step, I would join those nodes together into macro cells of a higher level. I think that's the way forward. Understandably, that detail, which really caters to the user rather than the advancing of the simulation, right, academically, um, is not in Jenny Owen's explanation, which is fine. I mean, of course, um, you know, the, the speed slider and a zoom slider aren't in any of these either, for obvious reasons. Um, it's just something that I'll keep in the back of my mind because at some point I will want to implement the time step, ramp up, ramp down functionality. And it's been implemented. It's been implemented in, Gosp, uh, in Gali and it's been implemented in um, Copy's Life. What is Copy's name? Sorry, one second. Fabian. I will also reach out and thank Fabian. Um, but again, I am not going to take anything from Fabian's uh, hash life implementation. Not to mention the fact that um, the code Fabian wrote to do hash life uh, presumably is specific to Conway's Game of Life, which is a different rule set than the one that I'm working with. Um, but I have no motivation to cheat or steal. G 
Jeez. Sorry, Dr. Dobbs, whoever wrote this. Um, who did write this? The author is not listed. But honestly, my eyes are glazing over reading this. And me getting bored is not fun to watch on Twitch. Here, one second. Right. Right. Oh, my first improvement to the base. It's Gosper. <laughs> this is an article Gosper must have written. Okay. Good algorithm, Gosper. Um, also, I'm glad you're keeping the spirit of Martin Gardner alive. Right, quad tree. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Nothing new yet. You know what? I'm, I'm going to skim past this. I'm going to look at the code in here. Class node, next generation. If level is 2, do base. Right, so this is the trivial calculation. Otherwise, new node. Oh, that's handy. Okay. Uh-huh. Why a simple recursive algorithm? D right. Yep. I construct nine new nodes. So the nine new nodes that Gosper uh, computes are... So remember, this red box, this red box, this red box, and this red box are the futures of the child nodes. But this red box, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, they need to be recalc... Uh, they need to be temporarily constructed. And they generate this 6x6. Six six. Sorry, they generate this 6x6. Six six. And then 1, 2, 3, 4 generates the 4x4. Four four. Okay. Node is a function centered subnode. Return new node. Right. Center horizontal. Oh, I see. Oh, clever. Okay. So these, so notes from Gosper. Notes from Gosper's Dr. Dobbs article. Create utility functions to generate the temporary macro cells from the child macro cells of the <laughs> of the child <laughs> okay that's hard to parse but basically this code so these are utility functions that generate this node, and where does it get its pieces from? From the existing child nodes. That makes perfect sense. I hadn't thought that far. Node next generation, if levels two, do the base, right? Else, okay. So this was temporary. Oh, this is the thing that doesn't work. I see, right. Right, right, okay. So instead of that, it's this. You generate the nine extra nodes, and then you calculate them. Got it. Huh. Ah, I was expecting more next generations. This is the increment that the uh, YouTube presenter was talking about. So this allows you to reconstruct a central node and call next generation. But by doing next generation on these buddies, you get...
right, immutable bitmap. I can't do bitmap. I can do nibble map. <laughs> Bit means on and off, and I've got dead wire said uh, cell head. So there's no need to have distinct nodes that share the same value, right? Okay. Right. By itself, this this is in Java, so it's not Gosper from let's call it pseudo Gosper because it's somebody who I thought was Gosper and speaks as someone who's implemented this already, but this was someone who... You know what? Let me just pull up the actual credits for this article. Who wrote this? Oh! This... Okay. This is the person who presented that YouTube video. Okay. Not pseudo Gosper. Okay. Yes. Cool. Provenance. So... Yep. Canonical tree node. Applying canonicalization with a cache to improving the performance of a Fibonacci uh, algorithm. Okay, recursive formulation. Add a single pointer to the node data structure that stores the result, right? If the pointer is not null, contains it. The speed up attained through memorization that was enabled by keeping next generation partly functional more than offsets the inefficiency introduced by re returning a node a level down from its argument. Good. At this point, it's not quite hash life yet. Correct. We're incrementally closer, though. On the, some large universes with regular patterns, it is faster. Blah, blah, blah. Compression of time. Um... Compression of time. Indent. Right. The number of generations the recursive call computes. Horizontal forward, you grab the next generation. Next generation. Next generation. Grab the next generation of the child nodes, child nodes. And then you combine them again, next generation. That is hash life. Okay. I am feeling it. Okay. Yeah. This exponential computation, this runaway simulation is what I'm really working toward. Let me return to the beginning. In December 2000, on a private mailing list... Nick Gotts posed a new and wonderful 52-cell pattern called Metacatachrist. Golly. Patterns, hash life, Metacatachrist. Uh, view, fit pattern. Not much, right? It's probably going to create some... Glider guns, which is the name of one of the um, types of things that construct themselves in Conway's Game of Life. Okay, 8 to the 1, 8 to the 2, 8 to the 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 to the 8, 8 to the 9, 8 to the 10. And if you look at this, I mean, look at this. This density. What is all this? You zoom in, and it's tons of... <laughs> I 
<laughs> just zigzagging cubes, z uh, boxes. I don't know what they're called. Um, let's see how they're constructed. Let's go up here to the edge of one of them. Oh, interesting. These cubes aren't made one by one, but the process that makes them... Oops, the time step is still too high. Um, slower. Oh, that's funny. This UI is the same UI that um, the life simulation that Fabian, aka Copy, made uh, uses. So slow down the time step to one. Drag. Two. Zoom out. Three. Zoom out. Four. There, there they are in formation. Five. Incredible. Six. Seven. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Eight. And then boom, it, it reached the edge. <clears throat> Is there anything going on at the edge down here? Probably not. Just curious. Nope. That's funny though. That little. This little guy. Oh! <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay. So. Quite impressive, considering how simple the starting conditions are. Just a couple of these and a couple of those at the right distances to each other. I'm gonna blow my nose, one second. I have returned. Okay, so... <clears throat> Metacatechrist. Nick Gotts was confident it exhibited quadratic growth, but was not absolutely certain. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, coughing, one second. And back. He asked if anyone could run a hash life against it, having just finished a fast conventional life program, and having seen enough hints and rumors about how such a program might work. And since Bill Gosper's original implementation only worked on Lisp machines, of which there were few, fair enough, I thought it was time to try to write one. With my embryonic incorporation of the ideas I've presented so far, I was able to... able to run Metacatechrist to many trillions of generations and show that it exhibited quadratic growth throughout the range. This pattern is amazingly beautiful with fract fractal properties that cannot be appreciated without running it for billions of generations, and having the ability to display the resulting universe in some sufficiently scaled, zoomable form. We're well past the billions now. <laughs> <coughs> 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 
Okay. Awesome. Download the source code that accompanies the article. Sure. It's in Java. That's not so bad if I want to actually look at it. Read me. That's interesting. He's left some suggestions on things to explore. Also, whole another website. Not found. Well, it existed at some point. Hello. I see. I think I'm going to link to all of these sites in the description of, <clears throat> of this episode when I upload it, after I upload the last episode. Right, so. This, by the way, is what Fabian's simulator looks like. And it's going to accelerate the time step no, I'll do it. And it's specified down here. <coughs> uh, fit. Speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up. This is all JavaScript based. So I should be able to learn something from looking at its code without writing any code of my own. I should look that up. Can I... Okay. Independent creation. <laughs> I see. <laughs> I cannot implement a clean room implementation of this because I'm the person who will be looking at this code anyway. Do I? <coughs> Do I want to do that? <laughs> Just gonna back away slowly from that. Okay. Um, I will still link to it in the description, but I am not going to do that at all. Okay. I'm not looking at Fabian. Or Rakikis, actually. To do. Hash life. You've got what it takes to implement this all by yourself with the knowledge taught.
Okay. Hash life. Then what? I will copy paste naive, <clears throat> excuse me, naive, and this one is going to be called hash. Is it? What's a better name? Macro cell. So cool. Um, engine common. Let's pick a color scheme we haven't used yet. We're going to use current, I think. Whoops. Wire world JS. Default is going to be macro cell. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm at the end of a cold. I'm sorry. I'm in that gross phase. I just need to, like, physically get rid of it. Okay, macro cell, and then an index. Option class equals macro cell value equals macro cell selected macro cell. That doesn't work. What is going on? Wire world macro cell. Oh, here we go. There it is. It looks It looks cool. I hope it looks cool on the stream. Um But yeah, obviously this is not so right now, okay, so, <laughs> getting ahead of myself, running 
prettier. Everything's fine. Um, creating macro cell engine that as a copy of naive implementation. Setting, um, adding macro cell engine option to the GUI and setting the default option engine to macro cell. Hmm. Default engine should be specified in our world module transmitted to GUI. Let's just append that. Okay. real quick. Some code that doesn't need to be there. Okay. It's actually much nicer to look at when zoomed in. That's one of the downsides aesthetically to Wireworld. It's wiry, so you don't get to really appreciate the colors of any color theme unless the electrons are always bright and the wire color is always low contrast with the background. I'm getting distracted. Okay. Hash life notes. Macro cell. Old cells, new cells. We don't need that. We don't need that. We should probably store width and height. Cell IDs by grid index is a good idea. Hmm. We will not worry about save data until later. To do, implement reset. To do, restore from support, restore from save data. Update. To do cell, yada yada yada. Bloop. Hmm.
we might actually need to support a different rendering solution for this. Maybe. It just might make more sense to send a bitmap instead of this. To do. Maybe send a bitmap to the renderer. A bitmap of the head, tail, cells to the renderer. Okay, and this just creates the cell IDs by grid index, which actually we don't need because we're probably not going to. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. rely on render for the head IDs and tail IDs. Yeah, we still need to send the cell grid indices. going to worry about that right now. I'm going to do this. Return empty array. Nice. To do. Um. We still have this useful post debug utility function in the engines. That will allow me to basically console log everything. So... For example... There are all the cells. Great. Step one, post debug, hmm,
Save restore from bitmap if it's present. There you go. Macro cell utility methods. Nope, that's one, two, three. Implement update function. Input time step. Turbo or no? And then six, implement reset from head IDs, tail IDs. Create a bitmap. Uh, rasterize, really. Rasterize. Well, yeah. And then read into initialize macro cells from rasterized result instead of initial rasterization. Of initial data. Okay, rasterize into map into matrix of cell state. That's how we do it. <laughs> in reset, we initialize the hash life from data in reset. So actually, initialize doesn't do anything. Not really. Reset is where we throw away the, well, empty the cache. <laughs> Build. Hmm. Build quad, well, build um, macro cells from save data or from initial data. Okay, so just like engine common holds on to original data, macro cell will also. Original data equals data. Or from original data. R um, rasterize save data into matrix of cell state. Okay, so that makes these basically the same. So reset from head IDs, tail IDs is no longer necessary. Okay. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. 
let cache equal new map const cache equals new map mdn map clear is that yes so cache dot clear If save data isn't null, const um, okay, const raster equals rasterize const cell states equals save data is null original data dot cell states otherwise Recover two cell states. Get cell states save data. That's what it is. Okay. Const get cell states. If save data isn't uh, is null, return original data dot cell states. Const cell states equals array height dot fill dot map. Array dot width, oops, array width dot fill cell state dot. Ugh. Cell states equals original data dot cell states dot map row row dot map state state equals cell state dot dead cell state dot dead Okay. Four. Let y equal zero, y is less than height, y plus plus. For x is less than, uh, x equals zero, x is less than width, x plus plus. I don't like this either. Const, okay, const cell states equals, I'm just gonna make a 2D array real quick. Array, height, dot fill, dot map, array, width, dot fill, cell state, dot dead. Four, let y equals zero, y is less than height, y plus plus for let x equals zero x is less than height uh, width x plus plus okay so 
So now we have every y and every x. Const index equals y times width plus uh, x. I'm getting ahead of myself because save data is going to have value, a value in it that, okay, I'm just going to hold off on this for now. To do, return cell states. rasterize it into a matrix of cell state right that's what this is going to be transfer save data into cell states build macro cells from save data or from original data <coughs> const one second the width height largest pow to uh, smallest um, let's just call it size so width and height cool um, size equals let's see const largest length equals math dot max width height size equals one while size is less than largest length size gets twice as big there's probably a better way to do this. Hang on. It's like math.log? Base 2? This is fine. This is readable. Um, we're also going to add let times um, sim what would you call it? What does golly call it? Step. Step pow equals one. To do um, no, step pow is one is fine for now. So then Sorry, that gets added to the to-do. Reset the... Well... Grow the... Grow or shrink the simulation. Hmm. Okay. Step power is one. It's recursive. So this 
building of macro cells needs to be recursive as well. Build macro cells. Step pow. Cell states. No, I create the bottommost layer first. How am I representing this? Because this is where the macro cells need to go into a grid, but the grid needs to be remade for every layer? Yeah. 4 let i equals 0, i is less than step pow i plus plus, const. This is annoying. Do I seriously have to create a grid of macro cells for every step that I'm simulating just to generate them? You know what? Forget this. <clears throat> it's not that we make a bunch of grids. That is a quad tree. So we're going to say Ugh, No, I need to think this through still. Step powers one, top cell equals null. Okay, here we go. Top cell equals, and now here's a recursive function, generate um, reset macro cell cell states zero zero here cell states step pow Ah, uh, no, it's um, size. Yep, size. Zero, zero. Okay. And now I need to make this. Cool, okay. Const reset macro cell. Make macro cell. 
load. Load macro cell. Cell states, size, um, x offset, y offset. Okay. If size is equal to one, is equal to two. Okay, so cache is new map const base cells equals new set leaves. leaves. Let's see. Okay. Const make macro cell. Let's make cell. Okay. Make macro cell equals. And it's like... Leaf const make cell equals northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest result. So leaves is make leaf cell state dot dead. cache and then we immediately say cache dot add um, leaves dot for each leaf cache dot set uh, shoot we need to memoize well I'm learning a lot <laughs> we can't put anything in the cache until we have a way to map to like a, a key. We need to memoize it. Which for Conway's Game of Life is just a long bit field, I guess? No, no it's not. GUID 
for this is where I got stuck 10 years ago because I did try this 10 years ago in Wireworld AS3 um, source net resmason Wireworld brains or maybe I got rid of it probably did X model, X classes, net, res mason, wire world. Tree model, and tree calc scope, and tree node. I think I need to start simpler. Start simple. Build simulations from nothing. Here. Figure out how to memoize a macro cell. Because it can't just be a hash of the actual state. It can't just be a hash of the actual state of the cell. It's got to be based on the IDs of its children. But those IDs are memoized. Ah, okay. When you create the smallest macro cells, they populate the Okay, so convert I'm gonna It's like I'm trying to fight for a good vantage point for actually writing the thing. I could build it up from the bottom. Convert a grid of cells into a macro cell. That's the first thing that I should do. Doesn't matter how, just yet. Just do it. Okay. That's where I'm going to start. Represent... cells in a quad tree. So actually, there is some merit to building this conceptually from simpler ideas. So I know how to make a quad tree. I mean, it's not even a hard quad tree. There is a definite leaf at the one by one pixel level. Uh, the one by one cell level for a macro cell. And there's definitely like a four by four um, thing going on for the two by two. And there's a four by four, sorry, there's, there's four um, cells in the eight by eight and four cells in the 16 by 16, etc. So, 
Doesn't matter how. Yep, okay, so once I get the cells in a quad tree, modify the quad tree to look for, to search for, I think, to search for northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast in the cache. If it doesn't exist, create it. ID plus plus. So everything is gonna, every macro cell is gonna have a, its own ID. Make it a string, actually. String grid. It doesn't matter what the value is as long as it's unique. Right? I don't know. Modify the quad tree to search for a, an existing parent of its children in the cache. If it doesn't exist, create it. Return it. Okay. I'm going to reset macro cell entirely. So it's back to being the naive implementation. But up here, I'm going to say const cache equals new map, const leaves equals just as before. You know what? Cell state. Cell state is a thing. It's got properties. Yep. Object dot values dot map. Object dot from entries. Object dot entries cell state dot map name value name Call that state. Okay. Whoa. Uh, post debug leaves. Head, tail, wire, dead. Okay. MDN map add map set Ah, the leaves don't go in the cache. Okay, the leaves don't go in the cache. 
Um, yeah, this is fine. Cell template. Const macro cell template equals northwest null, northeast null, southwest null, southeast null, um, result null. Post debug leaves. All right. State null. Now, the reason I'm doing this is I kind of want the leaves and the cells to have the same footprint. Like, all this is unnecessary for the leaves. But if they have the same shape, then JavaScript might optimize them so that they can occupy the same value on one another. Okay. I think I can do this. All right. Going to do... You know what? Yeah, this is a distraction, so going to get rid of these. Size. Um, this is going to be called tree height. Okay. Get rid of this. Or rather, original cells equals data dot cell states. Do I care? Yes. Yep. And in here, return that. Reset. We're just going to do that. To do, update, to do, render, to do. Rendering and saving and restoring are going to be like the last things we figure out, actually. Okay, this ought to run still. And it does. Okay. So we've got original cells, and now we can mess around with it. Size equals one while size um, const max dimension equals math dot max width height. That's a better name. While size huh is it size or tree height? Hang on. It's both size, tree height. Size is one, tree height equals one. While size is greater than, is less than max dimension, size times equals two, tree height gets incremented by one, post debug, or yeah, post debug, um, size, tree height. 10, 24, 11. That makes sense. Hmm. Width, height, or er, max dimension. Okay, yeah. 800 is larger than 512, so we need to go up to uh, 1024. That's fine. Okay. And now we need to make a recursive function, which is top cell equals 
make cell we're going to call it init cell original cells right const cell states equals okay cells um, tree height Try this again to const init cell equals cell, yeah, cells height x, y. Okay. And this is going to return. First of all, we're going to make sure we've got the macro cell template represented, and then cell template northwest in its cell cells height minus one x minus bump y minus bump northeast southwest southeast result null Ah, hang on. Const. Northwest equals. Nope. If height is equal to one, then we do one thing. Otherwise, const northwest equals in its cell, cells, height minus one, x minus bump, y minus bump. Northeast, southwest, southeast. Northeast is x plus bump, plus bump, plus bump for south, plus bump. Okay. if cash dot has northwest dot id right these need an id id null Northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast. If it has it, const existing cell equals, and this is the ID, const ID equals that. If existing cell is null, Return existing cell. Let's turn this around. Okay. If cache dot has ID is false, then 
const cell equals, and here's where we actually make the cell. Macro cell template northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast. Result? Maybe? I'm not going to worry about result for now. And I don't care about state, but I do care about the ID. ID. Okay, cool. Cache dot set ID cell. Return cache dot get ID. Boom. Okay. This is gross, because it just concatenates the IDs, doesn't it? That's not it. This is the key. ID, IDs plus plus. Set key. Um, might as well do this. Uh, oh no, we don't. We don't need the. Okay, cool. Right. ID. 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 Cache has key. There is no connection between the key and the cell other than the mapping in the cache. Cool. Okay. That keeps us from doing this concatenation garbage, which would literally map to the recursive quad tree of stuff. That was a close call. That was almost stupid. Okay. Um, in its cell, IDs equals zero. Let's find top cell. Top cell doesn't exist. Let top cell equal null. Let IDs equal zero. <laughs> okay. This works. We need to handle the leaves, but northwest, northeast, southwest. One second. <laughs> Turn cash dot get key. Okay. If height is one. Oh, we also need to make bump. Um, so here, const bump equals two to the height minus one, I think. Let me think. If this is a two by two, then let's just try that. Height is one. Return leaves cells y x. Is it that straight forward? Leaves is an object where we're mapping. So this is. Um, cell states to leaves. We could just do new map. Dot 
get because that should be a cell state height minus one failed. Post debug cells y uh, cells y uh, let's just do x y I see that's why. Okay. So instead of that in its cell, this should be size over two, size over two. Should start at 512 by 512, and then we're subtracting <laughs> way too much height minus 2. This is, it gets too small here. <laughs> also, yeah, okay. So. Minus two is correct. That's so strange though. 512 minus 512, height minus two. X minus bump, X plus bump. be size over 2 minus 1, huh? So then, if 
height equals two. Height x y. Height equals one. Nope. Huh. I see. Hmm. So it shouldn't be minus bump plus bump. It should be like zero one should be the... Okay. This should be zero, zero. And then... think through it. But first I'm curious what this is. Undefined is not an object. NW.ID. <laughs> oh, that's why. Okay. So... State ID state. IDs plus plus. So everything should have an ID. Console, oh, post debug, NW, NE, SW, SE. Undefined for all of them. So in its cell,
Well, it's not looking in the cache for it. Const leaf equals cell states to leaves. Return leaf product um, post debug leaf um, leaf leaf is not equal to null. They are in null. Cells Y, X. That's why. Okay. <laughs> these aren't cell states leaves, these are the names of cell states. Okay, we don't need that at all. We need object.values cell state dot map state. Let's try that. Cell states to leaves. Dot has that false. Post debug cell states to leaves. You jerk. Here we go. Okay, object.values, cell states to leaves, uh, cell state, 0, 1, 2, and 3, good, dot map, state to, ah, that's why, um, state, there we go, Oh, that's a lot, that's a lot. Let's get get rid of that. Okay. <laughs> Let's get rid of these post debugs. And try that again. Am I posting top cell? I am, okay. Holy smoke. Okay. All right. All right. We got this. We got this. Just drilling down. There it is. <laughs> All right. Um, I know it doesn't look like much, but this is a big old quad tree, right? And in the quad tree, there are these relationships that result in these leaves. We just made cells in a quad tree that are cached. Quad tree of cached nodes. Check. Um, anytime you make a new cell, you have to create its future. Right? I think. That's the next question, this future stuff. At least we've got the quad tree. So maybe, um, quad tree of cache nodes, check. Anytime you make a new cell, you have to create its future. That is, that is the tricky thing. Um,
I may actually need to go up a cell. Or, um, up a, uh, up a level in the quad tree so that the light cone of the macro cell at the top contains the entire thing. But something else I could work on in the meantime is render to screen. New rendering system based on bitmaps. Bitmap can also be used for recovery. <laughs> Or save file instead of head IDs and tail IDs. It would be it would be worth considering um, So what's nice about macro cells is they don't know where they are. They only know what they're made of and they know their future, eventually. So, any time we need to draw anything, we need to do the same recursion that we just did in in itself, where we get the X and the Y, and we pass it into itself to render. <laughs> this recursive structure is probably going to crop up again. I mean, how else do we draw it, right? Rename this offset. Height minus three, height minus one. Child height. I gotta say, the fact that I even have a quad tree makes me feel great. Prettify. What changed? Macro cell template got expanded and cell states to leaves got turned into a single line. That's fine. Right? Yeah, this is fine. I'm going to rename this to cell template though. Cell template. Yep. I wonder, tricky relationship, bet so how does clearing the, hmm.
how is the cache pruned or cleared? If it's pruned, how are new IDs, new GUIDs decided on? How are GUIDs impacted? Because there's an int max to worry about. How many cells do I currently have? Should be easy to find out. IDs, post, debug, IDs, top cell. Our quad tree contains 4,033 unique cells. That's actually not that much, but it only represents an instant in time. We have not yet populated the cache with the future. And... Yeah, I guess, I guess the future, I guess the update function is going to replace top cell with its future. And it's going to make that new top cell from... A recursive function. Jeez Louise. Alright. It's 10 p.m. Pacific. The sun has set over the uh, skybox in the corner of the level. I'm excited. I'm also parched. Um, soon after I'm done here, I will... Um, upload last week's episode and this week's episode, and I'm going to put um, these fine folks, the links to their things, what was it, GitHub, Copy, Life, I'll put links to these four things in um, the description this time. Oh, I need to finish, uh, okay, so, um, the Quad tree composed of cached nodes is implemented. Pretty exciting. And I'm going to tag it. Tag episode 11. And push. Well, thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I'm excited for the next episode. 